Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, our second talk in the, in the session is by Bertrand Meyer, who also presented um, at the first Rotor uh, RFP workshop two years ago. Um, Bertrand is professor of software engineering at ETH Zurich. He's also the co-founder of Eiffel Software. He's also an active participant in the ECMA standards process for the CLI and, of course, for Eiffel. Um, his talk um, today is on Scoop, Concurrent Object-Oriented Programming for Rotor. Thank you very much, Mark. So another possible title for this talk and anything that I can describe about Scoop would have been something like uh, how I wasted six months of my life. This was a, this was a, a while ago, and I spent six months of my, li of my life staring at this piece of code here. And after a, uh, after a while, you know, I they had to put me on artificial feeding, and uh, they were debating about the ethics of the situation and so on. And I just couldn't reconcile myself to what was happening in a concurrent context. Now, this is the kind of code that I uh, typically look at, and usually doesn't bring me into that kind of situation. The, uh, so this is, uh, this is going to be to take a queue, and it's going to take uh, an element and try to put it into, in, into it, and as you can see, there is a precondition that says that the, the queue should not be full, and um, if that's the case, well, the post condition is actually not as expressive as it could be, but we won't go into this for the moment. So this is great, great because I can use it as an API, so I don't even see, need to see what's in the do uh, part, but I'm going to write things like this and, and still, uh, still uh, sleep at night, right? The, uh, I, uh, I have my queue, and if it's not full, then because of the precondition, then I'm uh, entitled to put something into it. Now, of course, from queues, there's a seem seemingly easy step to, to buffers, right? So this becomes c concurrent, and, uh, well, all, all hell breaks loose, because between the time I test for the queue not being full and the time I actually uh, do, uh, st store it, then uh, some uh, friend or enemy or uh, anyone can come in and, for example, put something into that queue. So um, it was very, very hard, and I hope you sympathize with me psychologically as to how, as to how hard it was for me uh, to, uh, to reconcile myself to the idea that the whole thing completely breaks down. Okay? And, and the, the usual style of reasoning it was, uh, doesn't apply anymore, and it was there staring at me and I just couldn't accept it. So I also had to go into analysis and counseling and so on. I'll skip that particular part. So that's the general issue. Can we bring concurrent programming to the same level of abstraction and convenience as sequential programming? When I say abstraction and convenience, I'm not, there's absolutely no irony in, in, in this. It's all, it's all relative, right? As compared to, sequ to, uh, to concurrent programming, sequential programming today is really very convenient, smooth, abstract, easy, organized, structured, and so on. Well, the world is not sequential anymore. We, uh, as was already uh, uh, clear from several of the previous presentations, we want to do multi-threading, we want to do internet. I even added coroutines uh, at, uh, at, at the end here after the, third, the last two presentations. Uh, it's quite interesting that coroutines seem to be, last three presentations, it's interesting that Coteens seem to be coming back into fashion at the moment. I'm really impressed. So we want to do this. Now, there used to be this uh, joke about object-oriented programming in the early 90s that is like teenage sex. You know, if, if everyone says they're doing it, a few are actually doing it, and the few who are actually doing it are not doing it very well. And uh, th this is almost true with uh, respect to concurrent programming, except that uh, many are actually doing it, which makes things e e even worse. And in fact, that is really the problem, and e that uh, we haven't uh, done with respect to concurrent programming what we have been able to achieve with more traditional sequential forms of programming. If you look at the major two revolutions that have occurred in the field, namely structured programming, you know, even in the vulgar sense, not the Dijkstra sense, but the vulgar sense of removing go-tos and uh, staying with uh, high-level control structures. And of course, after that, object technology. In both cases, you have the following characteristics. So how we work at a higher level of abstraction. We, uh, the, the techniques dem demonstrate remove bugs. They, they, remove, they both remove and add restrictions. Certainly in the case of, say, structured programming, you know, no go-to, uh, again, vulgar view. 
Well, and, and, but you also add some, re, you, you also remove some restrictions. For example, in our vector oriented programming, you can do dynamic binding and so on. So it does things for you. Dynamic binding is a good example for this. You don't have to do if, da da da, if uh, car, then do this. If motorcycle, do that. You, it does things, things for you. There is a mathematical basis that's very important. In the case of structured programming, it's basically Hoare, I mean, Floyd Hoare Dijkstra uh, semantics. And in the case of object oriented programming, it's abstract data types. Now, there, this mathematical basis is very important, but it's also important in the fact that there are lots of people who do uh, object oriented programming, for example, who, who have no idea about abstract data types, and lots of people who, who benefit from structured programming who would not recognize a whole triple if they found one in their bathtub when coming, out, coming back at home uh, at night, right? So, but still benefit from it, and it's still reason at a high level of abstraction. In particular, and I should have added this point to this list, the, you reason less operationally. You know, when, well, why was it good to remove the go-to is that you don't have to think about your program thinking, oh, I'm here because I'm, uh, X must be equal to 3 because I come from here. Oh, no, no, wait, wait. I'm actually coming from there, or I could be coming back fr from there. So this is very oper a very operational mode of thinking. A and advances in programming have, been able to, ha have enabled us to uh, use a less operational, more abstract, more static uh, form of reasoning about programming, and this is, and this is exactly what has not happened with concurrent programming. And it's uh, uh, without implying any criticism at all. It was quite clear in the previous talks. We still talk about uh, locks and mutexes and semaphores and so on, which in a way makes me uh, feel younger because this is really 1968, right? And, you know, when I was in the streets of Paris uh, trying to, to, to burn the whole the whole place, so it's, it's kind of a, a nice, uh, ple pleasant feeling uh, uh, again. But, uh, and of course, this whole thing comes from, from Dijkstra anyway, which is kind of ironic, but it's semaphores, so it's the c concurrent programming equivalent of go-to's. And basically, if you look at the threading models today, you know, many are doing it, but they're doing it the same way as in 1968. They, uh, the, the level of abstraction has slightly at all, if at all, uh, uh, been raised, okay? So it used to be messy, and it's still messy, where sequential programming on the left is less messy than it used to be. So, for example, uh, threading uh, models are the uh, typical uh, case, and it's, it's, again, completely operational reasoning. I mean, if you, if you listen to presentations of how threading works in, in uh, well, current approaches, you, you have to, you, you listen to things, to, to comments of the form where, okay, this uh, x is going to be equal to zero, except that it, we might have a data raise because this other thread can, could come in and so on. So this is just exactly as with a go-to, except that at least with a program involving go-tos, you can debug it. For, uh, you, uh, you can test it. In, con in a concurrent case, forget about it. I mean, you can still I make mean, people pretend that they're testing their, uh, their con concurrent code, but th they don't believe it and no one else believes it at all. So th that's what we're trying to, to, to address. We're trying to, to come up with the ideal model in concurrent programming, and we're not the only ones to do this. To do this. Uh, there are uh, research teams all, all around that are trying for the same holy grail. We think we are better, but uh, it's not for us to, to, to judge, and certainly there are some open problems. So that's what Scoop is about. And I'll just give you a very short, a very small example before I get into the, the uh, details and, and also show you the, the way we've implemented this whole thing in, uh, uh, on .NET. The, this is the kind of code that we write in Scoop. So the, I, I, I must say, I mean, without any modesty uh, whatsoever, that I've seen quite a few um, solutions of the dining philosophers problem over the years, but I think it's hard to beat this one in terms of, of, of conciseness. So basically, philosophers think, and, uh, and then they eat, and in order to, lead, to eat, they need two, sorry, I shouldn't be pointing at one of the screens. Uh, they need two forks, left and right, and, and that's it. Okay. So this does the reservation, and what was quite interesting for me is that I wrote this code, I think almost 12 years ago, far long, long, long before there was any implementation, and this code essentially runs. I mean, I have this uh, attitude of a programmer who never ever believes that anything is going to, uh, to run, especially, but, but it does. It is. So it's exactly that code. Uh, well, it could start a bit faster. That's uh, definitely here. And like everything good in the world, we've had a few examples already in the previous talks. It was the, this particular example was done by an intern. You know, the, uh, thanks, thanks God for interns. Um, so let's see. I have a few more philosophers. Uh, 
So, okay, speed, I'm going to make them a bit faster. There's a philosophy of speed and animation speed. And, okay, that's it. I mean, the, the, this is actually a bit fast to see, to see what's going on. And there, there's, as far as, uh, uh, as I can tell, there is no uh, deadlock. I mean, you, you, uh, through there is no deadlock, right? It has run for, for 30 seconds now. So the, what's, it's exactly the code that I, that I showed before. And also, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I won't have the time to go into the uh, details of, of the model at all, but there is no notion of active object at, at all, the, which actually uh, an active object, active object is, is really a contradiction in terms, if you think about it, if you, if you think about the basics of object technology. So in particular, in order to get the kind of active part, we simply inherit from a class process, which is a library class, and I'm particularly proud of this thing, you know, pro, uh, the renamed setup as getup. Setup is the initial operation of a process, and for, uh, for a philosopher, it's uh, getup. Okay, anyway, so the mechanism, now starting in a slightly more orderly uh, fashion after this overview, mechanism is called sc scoop, it, it goes back uh, long, F f uh, into the 20th century, and it's now being implemented for, for good at uh, ETH, uh, thanks in particular to, to, the, um, uh, to the rotor funding, and it runs on top of the compiler for .NET, so the, maybe I should mention it here for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, that there is a full-fledged implementation of Eiffel for .NET. It was one of, I think uh, one, one can say that together with COBOL, it's uh, the, the major success story of languages available commercially outside of Microsoft languages on top of, of .NET. It's, uh, the first version came out late 1999 and, and as a commercial product about two year, uh, one or two years later. So full-fledged implementation of, of, of Eiffel taking advantage is completely uh, well, it's very far, CLS compliant, completely interoperable with other languages, and it has two versions, one which is the classic Eiffel, Eiffel Studio implementation, so that's, the, that's for people who dream Eiffel, or think Eiffel, sleep Eiffel, eat Eiffel, uh, and, and who, who just want to use Eiffel on .NET. And, and the second one in Vision is the plugin for Visual Studio .NET. And, and the two project formats are compatible, so you, you can go back and forth between the two. So if, for example, if you're more of a .NET programmer who wants to use a little bit of Eiffel in, the, in, the, in your application, then you, you'll probably use Envision to, to mix it more easily with other languages, but uh, you can switch back and forth. Okay, I'm not going to, to spend very much time just describing the basic concepts of, of uh, Scoop since I, I want to talk a little more about the implementation. Let me just take a few minutes to to, to recall the basic concepts, not so much, I mean, my, my dream is always that, that the ideas in the end appear so inevitable that, you know, everyone in the room redesigns the whole mechanism with me. That's, of course, a bit uh, unrealistic, but I would still hope that you can understand the, the reasoning, the, the rationale behind, behind this whole thing. So there are no active objects, as I mentioned. The, 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 the first time anyone thinks of concurrency in the context of object technology, there's almost a universal reaction of saying, oh, this is a marriage made in heaven, it should, it should work. Uh, as exemplified, for example, by this comment by Roman Miller. And then, about 30 seconds later, you realize it doesn't work. The, 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 do you have, the, there's some similarities, but the, the, the impedance mismatch is actually worse, uh, is, is bigger than the similarities. For, so if you take, in particular, this notion of active object, this idea that you should, make, you should give objects their own scenario, the way actually it already was in, uh, in Simula, that's the, the re, I mean, that was quite innovative, but I think that's the part of Simula that doesn't uh, you know, transpose, that it doesn't uh, scale up. I like, I love almost everything else in Simula. The, this one doesn't work because if you have objects that have their own scenarios, we, you, the, so an object is going to do, uh, an active object is do, going to do something, a certain process. And then the other one, the, another object is going to have its own process. But then an object is also a, a repository of services available to the rest of the world. So maybe object A is going at some point to require some service, some feature from object B. 
And then what happens? They have these conflicting agendas. So then this is how you run into all kinds of problems uh, which are heavily documented in the, in the literature. They have one big advantage, which is that they are excellent as paper producing the, the, the devices. But in terms of practical utility, it's uh, more limited. And, and I think the evidence is there, simply that no object-oriented concurrent mechanism has gained wide acceptance, apart from these low-level thread libraries that are really not object-oriented but that everyone uses. So that's really what happens in practice. So let's take, a, let's, take, let's take a step back for a second to say something very, very deep. Okay, and actually, I'm saying this because it's completely elementary. To perform a computation is to apply certain actions to certain objects, and then using certain processors in order to be able to, to execute these actions. So the, the object technology has been there basically to tell us that the objects are more important for the overall structuring of the code than the actions, but they're, of course, both necessary. And we've tended to ignore the fact that we have a processor, although we know it's there, but in sequential programming, there's only one. So we don't need to, to, to pay that much attention to it. And I would contend that what becomes new with co concurrent computation is that we can have, in fact, several processes. And of course, I'm taking the word processor even in an abstract sense. It could be a physical processor, but it could be a thread, it could be an app domain, it could be, uh, it could be anything that can execute actions. So, uh, actions and objects. So, the, the first rule that we're going to take, accepting that we have, we can now have several processes, lots of them, zillions of them. And the first rule that we're going to take is that all calls on an object, I mean, of course, in object-oriented programming, what we do is calling operations on objects. All calls on a particular object are going to be ex executed by a single processor. So we call it the handler of the processor. So this immediately r r rules out a few interesting things, like, for example, object migration. But it seems so beneficial for simplicity and understanding that I, I, I think it's worthwhile. We can always implement, for example, object-oriented migration Migration, object migration on top of that basic framework. But to, to be able to reason about the whole thing will put this restriction. So you see what I'm doing. I'm trying to, to make the whole thing manageable by putting enough restrictions as, uh, uh, as needed. I think this part I'll skip. Well, maybe not quite. In fact, well, sorry. The, the, what's nice about the traditional approach to object-oriented programming is that even for those people who don't know anything about the formal basis, there's still this in intuitive understanding that you, you, if you have n operations, n features in a class, you would have n things to prove. So if we don't prove things, let's say there are n things to understand. So they are independent. Now, if we start having interleaving, then that's not the case anymore. The, the, the space of things to understand explodes. So again, in the spirit of simplicity, I'm going to require mutual exclusion of the various features, meaning operations, on any particular object at any particular point in time. So this is also a strong restriction. And in fact, it, in practice, it's not as bad as it might appear at first. In particular, of course, if we think of a really big object, like a database, this is unrealistic. We're not going to let just one client access a database at any particular time. But we'll have the restriction maybe on, uh, well, the database in practice is going to be split into many different objects. So the, 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 the uh, restriction is not as big as it sounds. OK, now, we still haven't really identified the key distinction between sequential and concurrent. So the, ne the, the next step is, is to do exactly this on, by looking at the fundamental operation of object-oriented programming, which is something like this, x dot r, uh, with a certain argument a. That's what our object-oriented programs do again and again at execution time. So there's been an instruction before, and there will be instructions afterwards. And well, the, 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 key, the key aspect here, viewed from the uh, standpoint of execution order is that we, since we're doing one thing at a time, the call has to be synchronous. It has to be blocking in the sense that while we're executing R on this supplier object, the rest of the computation doesn't progress. Now, the difference, what's really new, in, uh, I think, in a, in a concurrent context is that these two objects could be handled in the sense just defined by different processes. So there's really no reason to wait on the client processor. And actually, if we always waited, one might argue that there's no, not so much need for, 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 for having concurrency. I mean, if we have a zillion computers, but they are all, they are all waiting on each other, 
whenever they ask something from each other, why why just why not just have one? You know, very fast processor, very fast computer. So that's what we're going to say. We're going to say that uh, if a supplier, if the handler of the supplier object is a different one from the supplier of the client object, then the call is not blocking. It's asynchronous. So we narrow down the distinction between concurrent and sequential to this particular point. Now, of course, if we have a, a different uh, syntax, uh, semantics, it's usually, usually considered you know, polite practice to have a different syntax as well. I mean, we, you could, of course, tell the, the, the programmer, well, you know, uh, just wait until execution time and you'll see what happens, but that's not too good. So the general idea, I'll, I'll come back to the uh, slide that I just gave, but the general idea is that it, if a call is going to be handled by the same processor, it's blocking, otherwise it's not blocking, which I call synchronous and asynchronous here, and this must be re reflected in the syntax. So in the second case, we'll write separate CX uh, instead of just X to declare the type. So this is the only language extension to Eiffel that we have in this mechanism. That, that, that's it. Uh, of course, we, we, we are going to have some changes in semantics as well, but in terms of extra syntax, that's it. So coming back to what I to, to, what, uh, to the first rule, the second rule, calls on non-separate objects are blocking, calls on separate objects are non-blocking. By separate object, I mean an object that is handled by a different processor from, from my process. And this has, be, this has to be reflected in the syntax. So when we say separate, we don't say which processor, we just say it might be another processor. That's good enough at this point. There's some consistency rule. Let me just give you an idea here. Let's assume that we have a routine P which takes an argument A of some type, and then here we use a separate B. So the problem, uh, if I had a little more time, I would actually ask this in the form of a question. Maybe you have seen it already. There's a problem here, which is that A actually refers to a field of an object. Uh, if we look at it from the, I'm sorry, I have to remember not to point, uh, apologize to the uh, right wing. Uh, members of the, of the audience, uh, please stop me if I do this again. The, this A here, for example, here I could do something like A dot F. Okay? And, well, A is a trader. Well, I call a trader an object that is declared as non-separate, but which in fact is representing, I'm sorry, let me start again. I call trader a variable which is not declared as separate, but which dynamically at one time refers to an object handled by a different processor. So we don't want traitors, basically. So the first rule for avoiding traitors is straightforward, and I did not uh, show it here. It's that when you're assigning you, uh, a value to a target, you can assign from, uh, no, from non-separate to separate, but not the other way around. Because if we assigned a separate value to a non-separate variable, then we would have a trader, and the semantics that's implied would be wrong. Here, we have another way of getting a trader because A is actually coming from, from another object, but it's not declared as separate. So there's going to be a first rule that says in such a case, you have to declare it as separate. So the rule is here. It's a bit wordy. Uh, for any reference actual argument, it doesn't matter for value arguments, what's called in Eiffel expanded value, for, for which there will be copy semantics. But if there's a reference, actual argument, the corresponding formal argument must be declared as separate. Now, there's, there's, there's like four or five rules of that kind. I give you the other one, uh, another one a second ago, which is the assignment or argument passing rule. And one of my students, Piotr Ninaltovsky, uh, started to dislike these rules uh, passionately because they're kind of ad hoc. So they're actually nice to present like this in an ad hoc fashion uh, pedagogically, but in the end they're just, uh, they're, they're just too, too inconsistent. So he has devised, uh, as part of this project, a type system which makes the, with annotations, with concurrency annotations, separate annotations, which basically results in us having just one rule now, which is, I think, quite nice. Okay, next and almost last element of the mechanism. Let's, I mean, I'm a programmer and I write things like this, where, where uh, sorry, X at the top, there's a type we should say, my, my stack. Okay. So I push an element on a stack and then a little later I get the top of that stack. So if I'm a naive programmer, I'm going to think that 
I get back the element A, the element that I just pushed. And if I'm lucky, of course, that's going to be the case, but as, as before, something else can have, can have happened in between. So, you know, people might say, well, big deal. The programmers need to be careful, and that's their problem. But in the same spirit of trying to uh, remove bugs and make things easier to, uh, to control and uh, permit less operational reasoning, we don't like this. So we're going to have a very stringent rule which says that a separate call, something of the form A dot F, where A is separate, will be permitted only if A is a formal argument of the enclosing routine. So the previous call code is permitted now only if this is a routine on, of which my stack, or X, is an argument, a separate argument. And of course, as, a, as, a, uh, as an associated a semantic rule, the, the routine will not execute until all these separate arguments have been reserved. So this is the fundamental object reservation mechanism, just pass the objects as arguments. Now this is very restrictive and I think it's one of the best things about the mechanism. In particular it means that all these difficult issues of resource reservation that otherwise have to be handled again and again by each application programmer are now taken care of by the mechanism. So this explains in particular my eat left and right uh, uh, scheme of the dining philosopher's example, which I think is repeated somewhere, and never mind. Okay, next, well, precondition, that's what I started with. This cannot anymore be considered a, a correctness condition. In a normal rifle in design by contract, the precondition is a correctness condition. So it is good, it's bad news for the client because you have to satisfy the precondition, but it's also good news because it means that if you do satisfy the precondition, then you're entitled to the result. Well, that's not true anymore. So this is why I stared for so long at this, and then I realized that there's only one possi possible reasonable interpretation, which is to make it a weight condition. And actually, this is very shocking to many people. Let me just give, give you one more thing about this because I'm running, uh, 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 I'm quickly running uh, out of time. Well, we've come to the conclusion, this student and, and I, that this was not only the right semantics in that case, but the right semantics in all cases. That is to say, waiting is the basis of life, right? Waiting is the basis of correctness. So if you have, like here, two preconditions, one that is a separate call, you know, dot, buffer, and buffer is separate, right, is full. And the second one, which is just a plain precondition, value positive, the second one is a waiting condition as well. Except that it's, the, it's, it's, it's such that the, a smart compiler, actually even a stupid compiler, can determine that value greater than zero, where value is an integer, uh, will either be true now or will never be true. So it's useless to wait. So it's kind of a compile optimization to turn a waiting condition into a correctness condition. So I, I agree this is a bit of the wall, but I think it's a, a style of thinking that makes a lot of sense. The basic semantics is waiting, and there are cases in which you know it doesn't help to wait. You know, if I ask you whether uh, the integer x is greater than zero, either it's greater than zero now, or it will never be greater than zero because, well, it cannot be changed. So the full semantic rule is that a separate precondition causes the client to wait. Okay. And actually, the full semantic rule, sorry, is that the, the call will proceed when the, all the corresponding objects are available and the separate preconditions hold. Okay, one more mechanism, the last one, resynchronization. I start, you know, x.f in Tokyo. I start x.g in Seattle. I start uh, y.f in Zurich. Okay. And uh, these are all non-blocking calls. So when do I wait again? Well, we could have designed a resynchronization construct. We didn't. The idea is that when there's a query, so the previous ones were procedures, commands, as we call them. In I, well, command and procedure is the same thing. Query means either an attribute or a function. And in Eiffel, the, there's a very strict symmetry between attributes and functions, unlike in most object-oriented languages. So they're, they're really treated the same way. So here, I need the object. To, I need a computation to be finished on X because I need some value on X. So this is where we resynchronize. This, is, this, is, this idea doesn't come from us. It comes from research uh, by uh, Dennis Caramel, who is now in Nice, and it's known as, we, we call it uh, lazy weight. I think he calls it weight by necessity. So clients wait for resynchronization on, uh, on uh, queries. Okay. okay, now there's one more mechanism that I'll just uh, describe very briefly. It comes from 
from a library rather than a mechanism, and it's not implemented yet, so I, I shouldn't talk about it too much. It, sometimes a, an object holds another object, has a lock on it, and you want to kill it. You want to, to grab the lock. So this is done in a very systematic fashion by triggering an, an exception. For those of you who are familiar with the field, we don't have express messages because this is, the, again, this is the kind of thing that makes it impossible to reason about the software. If we have exceptions, then it becomes possible. Okay, the implementation. We have built the implementation on top of .NET, remoting and, well, I'm sorry, this is, this is a plan. This is not done yet. That's what we would like to have, remoting and, thread, and, and threading. Um, we decided, I decided actually against the wishes of, of the rest of the team not to do this at the language level, even though it's a language extension. We decided, I, I decided to have it as a library because I didn't want to spend a year grappling with uh, parsing and uh, integration with the development environment and so on. So we implemented a library called Scoopli. For anyone, of, anyone who knows Swiss German, you, you'll get the inside joke because Lee is, is kind of a dimin friendly diminutive, you know, like line, I guess, in, in, in German. So, for example, the croissant that you get in the morning is, in German, is called a Gipfel, but in Zurich it's called a Gipfli. So we initially called it Scooplib, but it's now Scoopli. So that, that was, I think, the right decision because it enabled us to, cons to work on concurrency issues, not to work on language issues. Uh, and, for example, the, the, just very, very, uh, it's enough to get a glimpse here, but on the left is actual scoop code, the way we want to write it. On the right is code using uh, Scoopli. It, it relies fundamentally on the Eiffel agent mechanism, which is a kind of, which is basically a closure. It's a somewhat more general notion of, uh, of, uh, of closure. It's a la general lambda expression. So this is the code that initially we were writing manually to emulate the code on the left. It, it became tedious fairly quickly, so now we now have a preprocessor that basically takes scoop code and translates it into scoop lease. So we haven't updated the compiler yet, but it's, it will be straightforward, it's just reworking re from the, from, from the uh, preprocessor. Okay, let me just show you to finish a, a couple of examples, uh, of, of other examples. We have a nice Example, I think, well, it's for you to decide, of course. That's elevators. Now, if I, I could have borrowed the elevator itself, because we actually had a student buy, uh, build this with uh, Lego Mindstorms, and it's all con con controlled by a computer uh, running Eiffel. So we have this, we show this to, to visitors, except that it's rather fragile. So almost every time we use it, we break something, and we have to, and we're not too good at hardware, so we have to, to bring back someone to fix it. So here is the software version, which does not break. So it's elevators. What's nice about, what's interesting about this design is that it came straight from, from the Mabuk object oriented software construction, and once again it worked. I mean, it's exactly the algorithm that was written there. I mean, again, I, I, I'm saying, saying this, it may seem obvious, but I always have to pinch myself when I see something that I wrote and which actually runs on, on, on a real computer and not just in my mind. What's interesting about this design is that it's completely fanatically object oriented. That is to say, everything is an object with, uh, and, we, and every operation, I mean, everything is a separate object. So all these things, for example, buttons in cabins, you know, in every cabin you can have a, a, a row of buttons on every floor. All these are separate objects. So it's fanatically object-oriented and so fanatically concurrent. So, uh, I'll uh, show you the number of threads running in a second. So let's create a few elevators. Uh, the elevators are fast. So I can do it manually. I can, uh, so here there's a, a, a customer, so to speak, uh, who wants an elevator. It's very fast. Sorry. Uh, now, so it's much, fun, much more fun to do it as a simulation, and it's going to, st to have people click all kinds of buttons all, all over the place. Let me make it faster. Um, let's see if I can perhaps start a task manager. Whoa. Hello. Oh, yeah. Where do I see the, uh, the number of threads? I always forget, is it performance? Yeah. Uh, so just this, it created, yeah, only that's not too many, but we, we, it scale, well, the point is that it scales up. We, we, we have gone all the way to several uh, tens of thousands, I think, of threads, and, and, it, and it worked. So let me also show you, I think that will be the final thing I, sh I should 
should stop this thing. Why is it? Maybe this is an old implementation. We we used to we used to have you know busy wait, which is not too good for performance. This has been fixed since then. So, wow. yeah, yeah. The producer consumer example is the archetypal example of. Of, of using preconditions as weight conditions, because basically the uh, the consumer has the has the precondition not empty, and the producer has the precondition not full, and that's the way it works. Right? So did I did it start or something? Yeah, it's actually done by the same. This is a master's project, I think. All these examples. In the meantime, I'll show my conclusion slide. So is it coming back? Oh, oh yeah, there's actually two of them. Oh, no, OK, I, I killed the wrong one. Start again. So I'll show it to you. To, uh, I'll show it in the end. So as a couple of words of conclusion, we we f we feel that it's a model that makes concurrent progress. We've we've done lots and lots of examples. There there are several masters thesis reports that you can find on our site, which uh, b b cover all the ex all the standard examples and many non-standard examples of concurrent programming. And you know we we fare in terms of expressiveness and simplicity and clarity, we fare better on some and worse on, on on others. But really overall, I think it's it's very impressive how we can uh, ha do concurrent programming at a high level of abstraction. We don't yet have real life applications where what we have done is these examples but on the basis of, that, of those examples which are extremely diverse we are very uh, enthusiastic about the future. The, the goal has been to extend object technology with general and powerful support and to make programmers uh, sleep uh, better. So the status is everything is implemented on top of .NET as a result of this project so in, in, we are quite happy with the, with, with the result. Uh, duals are will be implemented within the next three or four months. Everything is available for download. The, uh, I'll repeat the uh, the URL in the next slide, which is also the last. And we also have numerous examples available for for download. So all those which uh, I may or may not have the time to, uh, all those which I showed and those which I did not have the time to show, uh, you, you can all download the executables. We are of course very grateful to, to this project for, for funding. We also have funding from the uh, Swiss Foundation, the Hasler Foundation, and the Swiss National, National Science Foundation. Now, what remains to be done? We still have lots and lots of things. I mean, the more we do, of course, the more we see uh, what else we have to do. There's the type system, so that's on the more theoretical side. I think it, it's too complicated at this point, uh, but I think it's the right uh, direction. We are working very actively. If, uh, if I had had more time, I, I would have shown this too on the application of the model to distribute and web services. We have interesting work going on. I think we can completely get rid of that log. Something that we don't do well in the model, it's a bit in, indirect and there we have to improve the, uh, the model. It's things like, for example, CSP or the ORC model of Jay Misra uh, do very, very well. It's uh, waiting, for, waiting on the first of several events. That's really what CSP showed very well in the eight hour rendezvous mechanism. We're not too good at this, so we, we need a bit of progress there. I'd, re I'd really like to put my hands on the compact framework. This is really where the future is as far as I'm concerned. I want to, to put this on phones, on uh, RFIDs, on shirts, uh, and so on. So that, uh, that's, I, I can't wait to be able to do this. We have, uh, again, uh, on, on all of this I have things to say. This, this, uh, this ongoing work, I, I've preferred to, in this talk to concentrate on, on what's already there and, and solid and well understood, but there's all kinds of things going into all kinds of different directions. So we, we are working in extensions for real time. And in the integration with a compiler is, I don't see it as a major problem. I never say this when there's a member of the compiler group in the group, in the audience, but then they're not here. So these are the two, this is the place, this is the place where 
you, you can uh, see the downloads, the papers, and so on. I also took the opportunity to mention the work that we're doing for introductory teaching, where, uh, another uh, big project that we have with, with uh, also some support from the curriculum initiative is introductory programming where, where we're use, using some fairly revolutionary techniques, and, and some of this work has an influence on that. So uh, let me see if my buffer came up, and then that will be it. No, it didn't come up. Why not? Oh, here it is. So now it should start. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay, so a few producers. And, um, okay, so maybe it should be a really fast producer. And, well, let's see. So, uh, yeah, well, the... The, the demo itself is, is just a producer-consumer. What's, what's really interesting is, is, is the code, which, which I didn't show you in full detail, but it's essentially this idea that you have a put operation that has require not is full as its precondition, and a get operation that has require not is empty as its precondition, and that's it. That, that's basically it. It takes care of the synchronization. And, of course, I should have had, I think, Faster, well, it's not that exciting with a big buffer and a relatively slow producer, but you, you, see, you see the idea. Any questions? If we have time for questions. Thank you just mentioned what you said some revolutionary approach in introducing programming that's teaching you have a major problem. How, how many hours do I have now? Yeah. So we, uh, to, to make it very, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I should, maybe shouldn't have uh, used a kind of high word, but I, I believe very much in, in, in that this is the right way to teach programming. In a nutshell, we want to, to, to have a modern introduction to programming, modern in the sense that it prepares students for the challenges of software engineering, not just programming. Uh, but it's still sound scientifically. So, and also I see this very much in the context of the way the software industry is going. And I teach Swiss students, I think it would be the same in the US or, or in generally industrialized countries. If I just teach them programming, I don't think they have much chance uh, ten, five years, ten years from now against not people from St. Petersburg who is going to be paid as much as they are pretty soon, but uh, you know, there's always going to be someone cheaper with the same skills. So uh, the idea is to train them to be systems thinkers and in particular to, to work with large amounts of code. So what, what we've done is develop a huge, well, fairly huge by academic standards piece of, of software, which is, a, which is a general graphical multimedia system. For the application domain is traffic in a city. And we, we throw the, these uh, 200,000 lines of code to them, add them on the, on the first day of, of, of the course. And, and they, they, they learn by progressing from consumer to producer. So we emphasize abstraction and contracts and interfaces and specifications and ADTs right from the start without necessarily using pompous words, but simply by showing them that they can actually pr produce exciting, interest, exciting um, visually uh, visible, v visually impressive programs right from the start by relying on this huge library, which again is multimedia, graphical animation, and it does really impressive things. And it, the first program they write is going to be 10 lines, but it's already very impressive because it uses all this code. And they're able to use this code precisely thanks to, uh, uh, to abstraction. So I, instead of pontificating about abstraction, which every computer science professor does, and me, me too a bit, of course, I, I, I try not to, but I try to show them that Thanks to the power of abstraction and uh, interfaces and contracts in particular, they can produce these interesting applications. And then little by little, they go from the inside out, from the outside in. That is to say, they learn to see how it's done internally. And this also ha has a big practical advantage, which is to solve one of the major problems we face today in teaching introductory programming, which is the incredible variety of previous experiences of students. You have some who have not barely touched a computer before, and you have some that have written an e-commerce ser server in, in the tens of thousands of lines. How, uh, and I'm the first phase that they see at university, basically. How do I teach? 
to, to, all, to both of these groups and every, everyone in between without risking losing some, boring the others. Well, this business of giving them lots of software means that the novices can really do what they're supposed to do and approach the difficulty by step. So this also means that I can avoid losing some, some students, which I would otherwise, but the more advanced ones. Right from the beginning, they start jumping into the code. Of course, it's all, given in, it's all available in source. They don't have to look at the source because they, they can look at the interfaces. But if they want to look at the source, they will. And it's amazing what, what, what they do. So there's, there's another uh, uh, URL, which, which, I would, which I would encourage you to, uh, to, to look at. Our, our, uh, ah. Yeah, it's, it's very easy. It's games.eth. Well, maybe I could even show it. Before, yeah, uh, right. Well, I'll, ju I'll just bring up this page, okay? Yeah, and you can always take, uh, take the microphone. You can always cut the sound, of course. But the, 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 there's this, this absolutely these 60 games that uh, 60 different groups of students have produced. But it's, uh, in about four weeks, they, they had very little time for the project, and it's uh, it's not even graded. They did it for the fun. I, I think you can see the the, the uh, what students are able to to, to do. And I'll I'll, st I'll stop here. So games.ethz.ch. Thank you. I'm sure there might be more questions. Since we're running late, I'll ask that the, the next this and the next couple talks, we'll have a couple of questions. We'll have ample time to continue discussion over dinner. Thank you.